Hello and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Jack Derwin and I'm Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. Today, we're very excited to host a talk with Mark Paoletta, one of the editors of Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words. In the interest of time, I'll keep his intro really brief here, but you can view his whole bio at fedsoc.org. Mr. Paoletta served as a lawyer in the White House Counsel's Office in the George H.W. Bush administration and worked on the confirmation of Justice Thomas. His most recent role in government was General Counsel of the Office of Management and Budget, and he is now a partner at Share Jaffe. After discussion, we'll go to audience Q&A, so please enter any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of right of your Zoom window. Finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion are those of the guest speaker joining us today. And with that, Mark, I think we can get right into it. It's really great to have you with me today. Hey, Jack, thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us for this talk about uh, my, my new book that I co-edited, as Jack said, with uh, Michael Pack. It's called Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in His Own Words. It's a follow-on um, to the great movie that came out in 2020 uh, of the same name. Um, and um, when, when Michael Pack made that movie, or I should back up a little bit, that movie came about uh, because there had been just a relentless attack over the 30 years of Justice Thomas being on the court. Um, and there was a movie that came out called Confirmation uh, that starred Kerry Washington as Anita Hill. In, it came out in 2016. I became aware of the movie in 2015 and was just livid <laughs> that the, the corporate media would continue to, to kind of do these types of movies and attacks, uh, one-sided smears on Justice Thomas. And so I wanted to make a movie that told Justice Thomas's, Justice Thomas's remarkable life uh, in a fair and balanced way. And so I talked to some friends um, and connected up with Michael Pack, who is a great documentary filmmaker, I was made about 15 films, most of them shown on PBS, maybe all of them have shown on PBS. And, uh, and in fact, he was interested in making this film on Justice Thomas. Uh, and so when, uh, and, and the genius of what Michael Pack did there, um, and I hope you know everyone has seen it. If you haven't, I really encourage you to, to watch it. It's on Amazon, it's on other different platforms, but it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. And what Michael did when he was looking at making this movie was, Instead of your typical PBS movie where you have people who are sort of pro-Thomas and then anti-Thomas, um, he thought he'd lose Justice Thomas's unique voice. Uh, and so he decided to just do a, a movie um, where he would interview Justice Thomas from his perspective. Justice Thomas recommended that Michael interview uh, Justice Thomas's wife, Ginny, uh, to kind of get a true sense of, of him and in, in, in their life, and particularly during the confirmation hearings. Uh, and so Michael Pack ended up interviewing Justice Thomas for 25 hours. This was back in 2017 and 2018. Uh, it was six sessions that Michael interviewed Justice Thomas for about four hours a clip. And then he in interviewed Ginny a little bit later, um, six hours, I think over three sessions. And I sat in most of those interviews and there were so many exchanges and so many discussions that I thought were just would be gold for the movie. Uh, and then when it came time to make the movie um, and I was watching it develop and Michael was sending me different cuts of it. Some of it was longer at first, but as we cut it down um, or as he cut it down, there was so much that was being lost. Uh, and I thought it would be sort of a crime to have these amazing exchanges and discussions and Justice Thomas's thoughts on his life, his jurisprudence on a cutting room floor, never to see the light of day. Um, you know, the first focus was let's make this movie and get it done. Uh, and that was that was done. But the idea was um, to, to 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 gather up all of this footage and put it into a book length interview. So that's what this book is. It's a follow on to the movie, but it's a book length interview um, of Justice Thomas from those sessions. And there's an appendix that has 30 pages or so of, of Michael Pack's interviews with with Ginny Thomas. And I thought the just to get a flavor of the book and how it sort of the, the, the passage, I think, that made me most want to try and get something into the film uh, that, that, that just couldn't because of time constraints was this passage. And I think it gives you a sense of Justice Thomas and those discussions and just um, so I'm going to read it since we have a little bit of time. Um, it's a little bit lengthy, um, but it's uh, on page 136 and 137 if you're all following along. <laughs> Michael asked him, well, on the more libertarian side, you also watched The Fountainhead, the movie based on Ayn Rand's book of the same name, right? And Clarence Thomas says, oh, I still do. I still watch it a lot. The Fountainhead, 
Um, I like the individual. Think about it. I'm in Savannah, Georgia. What's going on in Savannah, Georgia during my youth? Uh, all these things that the government tells me I can't do. I can't walk across the park. Um, I have to walk around it. I can't drink out of this water fountain because the colored one is over here. I can't go to Georgia Tech. There are all these things, all these limitations. If you drive down here, you don't have any rights. If you go over there, you don't have any rights. On and on and on and on. When I read Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, I'm not going to tell you I understood objectivism, but it emphasized the individual. I'm free to do what I want to do. That's in the individual. Then I read later on, after Black Boy and Native Son by Richard Wright, I read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Again, where is the invisible man? Underground. You get to think for yourself. You get to be who you are, despite what society says. So you have, so you have stood against segregation. You have to go in... You have to go indoors that they, uh, they said should be closed, right? Then why don't you get to think the thoughts that they say are closed to you, even if your own people are saying it? So let's just take an example. We agree it was wrong for me to be prevented from going to the Savannah Public Library. Okay, people agree. That's just against society. So then, okay, what if they let me go in the library, but they said there's a certain part of the library or certain stacks in there that are off limits to blacks? Oh, that would also be wrong. Okay. What if they say there are certain books that are marked, no coloreds allowed? Would that be right? No, that would be wrong. If all those things are wrong, it's wrong for them to prevent me from being in the library. It's wrong for them to prevent me from going to certain parts of the library. It's wrong for them to prevent me from going to certain books in the library. Why is it right for them to tell me I can't have certain thoughts that are in the books in the library? Obviously there is no answer, it's absurd. So that's a, a, a passage from, from Created Equal. And it catches, I think, Justice Thomas so well uh, in sort of peeling away, tearing away all the noise to get to what's, what's at issue. And so that's what the book is, is wonderful exchanges like that. 95% of what's in the book is not in the movie. You know, there's, it's a two hour movie. Um, it's 30 hours of, of interviews. So if you do the math, um, it's 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 most of it is not in it. all the all the movie is in the book because uh, obviously those a lot of those exchanges and a lot of those passages were were gold uh, and and that's what why it was such a great movie. Um, you know, a lot of you are familiar with Justice Thomas, but it's important to kind of go back to where he came from, right? I think in modern times, certainly he's traveled further, uh, certainly in the Supreme Court, and I'd say of, of most national public figures of being born into segregation uh, in, in 1948 in Pinpoint, Georgia. Uh, and he's born into, a, a, you know, in a little co coastal town right outside of P Savannah uh, to a broken family. His mom um, is, um, has, has three kids. She's a, um, a maid um, trying to raise three kids. And he's running around uh, with his brother and his mother's having difficulty raising him. And he goes to live with his grandfather when he's seven years old. And that changes his life. His grandfather, when he arrives, um, says, boys, the damn vacation is over. That begins this new life for him. And his grandfather is a man who was born in 1907 in the segregated South. And he um, is making his way and his grandfather teaches him hard work and discipline and no excuses. And he learns those lessons. He goes to work for his grandfather on his oil truck. He's got a small fuel oil um, um, business. And he um, learns hard work. His grandfather believes that in order to sort of really succeed, you need to go get a good education. And so he, roll, he enrolls his brother, Myers and Clarence into St. Benedict's Catholic School, which is an all black segregated Catholic school. And it's run by these Irish nuns who, um, uh, who, who, who are down in the South, uh, who are called all sorts of terrible things for, for being down South and, and, and teaching in the black schools, the all black schools. And, um, but they teach the, the, the students hard work, and no excuses. And they're gonna get them ready for um, their math, their, their history, their English. They're gonna show them that there's 
that they are equal. Despite what the segregation laws say, they are equal. And that is those two things, his grandfather, who, you know, teaches him hard work, discipline, and no excuses, and the, the nuns who teach him the same. Those are the, the most impactful people on Justice Thomas's life um, it, it, to this day. To this day, he talks about the nuns. He talks about his grandfather. His memoirs are called My Grandfather's Son. And so um, th 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 those are the most important foundational elements of Justice Thomas's life. Um, he goes off right to, into the seminary. So Justice Thomas is an altar boy at St. Benedict's. He goes into the seminary um, for high school and he loses vo his vocation. He goes into the seminary. He's the first of two black students to go into, um, into it was called St. John Vianney's um, minor seminary, it's a high school. Um, and he, he faces you know, racial uh, um, sort of episodes and racist incidents. And, but he finds his way there he goes off to the to, to the major seminary for college, and again, in there, he loses his vocation not because he lost his faith, but because he he thought the church wasn't doing not enough in in uh, addressing racial injustice, and so he leaves the. He, he, there's a terrible incident where um, when Martin Luther King is assassinated, one of the seminarians says, "I hope that SOB dies," and with that, Justice Thomas says he lost his his vocation and. When he was wanting to go into the seminary, his grandfather had said, you can go, but you can't quit. Uh, so when Justice Thomas quits, his grandfather, when he comes back home, his grandfather kicks him out of the house. And he goes up to Holy Cross uh, College, ultimately, to go to school. And there he becomes a radical by his own terms. He rejects his grandfather's and the nun's teachings. He says race and racism explains everything. He joins the Black Student Union. He becomes a leader of the Black Student Union, um, connects up with sort of the Black Panthers and Black nationalism. But even when he's going through those times, he's always fiercely independent. You, you really see Justice Thomas trying to sort of figure things out. And, um, and there's a, the, the Black Student Union, and it's in, interesting for times like today, the Black Student Union wanted to create a Black corridor in the, in the dormitory of only Black students on a particular hallway or, or you know, um, um, area of the dorm. And Justice Thomas said, you know, I just came out of segregation. Remember, Justice Thomas was born in segregation in 1948. He's going to an all-Black Catholic high school in 1964, 63, uh, and he, he breaks the, the color line in 1964. So now he's up at Holy Cross in the late 60s. And he's thinking, this is crazy. Why are we doing this? Uh, but he wants to support his friends. And so his agreement is, I'll live on the Black Quarter so long as I can have my, and when he had first uh, went to Holy Cross as a sophomore, his first year at Holy Cross, his, his uh, roommate was a white student from Rhode Island uh, who was great, became great friends with Justice Thomas. He was very helpful. They were great friends. And so he said, I'll live on the Black Corridor <laughs> so long as I can have my friend and my, my roommate, John, live with me. So that's what Clarence Thomas did. So kind of a classic Clarence Thomas uh, uh, um, action. Uh, he's kind of fiercely independent, loyal to his friends, always loyal to his friends. Uh, but I think that's a, a great way to capture Justice Thomas. Um, so um, he, he goes, you know, he's at Holy Cross um, and he gets involved with... Um, um, all these protests, and he goes to a protest in up at um, Harvard. Uh, it gets, it, 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 it's up in Boston. It goes over to Cambridge. It's an anti-war riot, and a riot breaks out, uh, and um, a lot of violence, a lot of um, just bad things going on, as he said. And he realized he had kind of jumped the the, the, the the rails, and that he had really become the antithesis of what he had been raised uh, to be. And so he, he comes back to Holy Cross that night, early in the morning, and he stops in front of the, the chapel, and he had left the church, uh, he had not been in a church for a, a few years, and he stood in front of the chapel, and he looked up at the, the cross and said, if, if you take to God, if you take anger out of my heart, I will never hate again. And Justice Thomas says that's the kind of the, the beginning of the slow return to his faith and to his grandparents and the nuns' teachings. Um, so, um, you know, so, so in this book, you can 
see Justice Thomas's intellectual journey. He talks about reading To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, A Native Son by Richard Wright, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, as, as we read from that passage. Um, and then of course, when he, when he leaves Yale Law School and goes out to Kansas City, so he goes to, uh, to Jefferson City, when he goes to Yale uh, Law School, he graduates in 74. As he says, he can't get a job in his view, because of the stigma of what people think are, is affirmative action, uh, it, you know, that he, it, as he says in the book and in the movie, we're going to discount that a little bit. Uh, and so Justice Thomas tells a story of how he interviewed with a number of different firms and he couldn't find a job until Jack Danforth, who was the new Republican attorney general and a, an alum of Yale Law School, came to town, interviewed Justice Thomas, Clarence Thomas, offered him a job in Jefferson City to work for, for Jack Danforth. Um, he goes out there and he talks about those days as some of the happiest days of his life. He had hundreds and hundreds of cases working in the attorney general's office. Um, he loved the people he was working with and so really finding his way. And he's also, again, intellectually, he was kind of moving now towards uh, if libertarian uh, to, to more conservative. Uh, and he discovers Thomas Sowell. And he said when he first read Thomas Sowell, I think at Yale, um, he had seen this book, looked at it a little bit, and threw it in the garbage and said, no black man could think this way. Um, he gets reintroduced to him uh, by a, a colleague in the attorney general's office who references this book that had just been reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. And Justice Thomas um, reads the book and loves it. He says it's like um, finding water in a desert. And he becomes a huge fan of, of Thomas Sowell. And to this day, they are extraordinarily close friends. Um, and Justice Thomas beats uh, Thomas Sowell uh, in, um, at Washington University in 1978. And Thomas Sowell is debating Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, on a panel. And Justice Thomas goes over and, and meets him and talks with him. And that begins this lifelong friendship. Um, so you see Justice Thomas again in this book talking about those days. Um, he comes into the Reagan administration um, and uh, there's a story on him just at the beginning uh, of the Reagan administration in December of 1980, just before it begins, uh, by Juan Williams. And Justice Thomas is talking about some of the problems of social programs and how they have adversely impacted his family and his sister. Uh, and it becomes this big story and he's pilloried. And I, I call that from, I think it was December 16th, 1980 is when that um, that article appears. And I, I, I sort of peg that as a day when Justice Thomas got on the radar of the left of wanting to destroy Clarence Thomas because he was not singing off the song sheet that was accepted. Uh, but he goes into the, the Reagan administration and, um, and um, it starts at the Department of Education and then moves over to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And that place is a wreck when he gets there. Uh, and he cleans it up um, there's, there's no filing system, there's fleas, it's dilapidated, they have no um, system for their records. He really cleans it all up, that's his focus. It's really kind of the managerial uh, part of it. And also bringing it back to, instead of doing these charging um, of companies uh, and, and settling for nothing, um, he, you know, he was looking for real discrimination and then hitting those companies hard with, with penalties. Uh, that's how he thought it should be done. Um, the Washington Post gave him great reviews um, um, and a great editorial about him having cleaned up the place. And after he had kind of gotten on, on top of uh, the, the job there, he um, is, becomes really interested in the Constitution and our founding. And that's where he hires these two Claremont professors, Ken Masugi and John Marini. And it's really interesting because I don't think there's another sort of presidential appointee who does that, you know, sort of kind of does a deep dive to learn about the constitution while he's running this agency. And it really becomes the foundation as Justice Thomas says, I was looking for a governing philosophy that showed that slavery was wrong right from the beginning. Uh, and so that's, that became the animating sort of through line for his, 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 um, um, his philosophical quest here. And, and, um, and it becomes, I think, the beginning of his jurisprudence uh, when he ultimately gets on the DC circuit. Um, so um, again, the book is um, Justice Thomas talking about these issues in a very conversational and informal way. Um, he talks about his time on the court. 
you know, he wrote his memoirs in 2007. Those memoirs ended, my grandfather's son, when Justice Thomas won on, this, on the Supreme Court in 1991. Um, and so this talks about his time on the court, uh, his approach to judging. It talks about his relationship with his colleagues, in particular, Justice Scalia. Um, he talks about stare decisis. And when he talks about stare decisis, it's interesting. He goes back to um, the, sort of this whole idea of, of his resistance of being told what to do, that he, um, you know, it's just this fierce reaction to, to being told, you know, you have to think this way, you have to do this. Um, and so um, with, with stare decisis, when it comes up, he calls it these notions of stare decisis. And he says, when I was at Holy Cross, I resisted this when I was at Holy Cross, I was told um, that I needed to listen to this jazz musician named Hugh Masekela, who, who I had never heard of, but I looked him up. And um, every you know, black student at Holy Cross was supposed to you know, listen and love Hugh Masekela. And Clarence Thomas says, you know, I didn't have anything against Hugh Masekela. Um, I didn't have anything against jazz. I like jazz, but I wanted to listen to country. I wanted to listen to classical. You know, the idea of them telling me what I'm supposed to be listening to was offensive. And, and then he ties it, goes over to stare decisis. And he says, it's like these notions of stare decisis. It's been decided. You need to go along. You need to do X. And so you, you can bring this all the way to Dobbs, or you can bring it to some of the other you know, cases when he looks at stare decisis and says, you know, I'm not, I'm not being going to be told to move along. Uh, I'm going to look at this anew. I'm going to look at this based on the original meaning of the Constitution. I'm going to you know, do my own work and come up with what I think is proper. Um, so I think it's a great, again, connecting up what I'll call his personal journey, his personal life with his jurisprudence and how it informs him uh, through the years. Um, he talks about his battles with the left um, and, and he talks about his confirmation hearings. He talks about um, um, the, the kind of liberal policies and, um, and, and tactics. And on the policies, this idea of virtue signaling, being for something and not really looking at how it's going to impact the communities that you're, you're, you're thinking you're helping. And, and, in, and in his view, a lot of times, not caring whether they're helping or being harmful to, to, to communities. Uh, so he spends a lot of time on that, um, you know, much more than the, in the movie. In the movie, he touches upon it, but there's pages upon pages of him going back to Again, his so a lot of his grandfather's comments and what he learned from his grandfather. And his grandfather seeing a lot of these liberal policies um, um, harming uh, the black communities um, in, in particular, uh, and and how uh, folks who are the theoreticians who sit in the ivory towers. And and one of the interesting things in terms of Justice Thomas's life when he went to Yale Law School. He worked at the Yale, um, at the New Haven Legal Assistance uh, Office for three years. For his entire time at, at Yale, he worked, you know, on the ground in an office in the city, helping people who had problems, uh, everyday problems, as he calls them. Uh, and so he saw what, you know, were the problems, and that the folks that were up in the ivory towers, as he calls them, some of these Yale students who had these grand ideas of how to save humanity, didn't have any connection or understanding of how those issues or how those policies would, would impact the people they thought they were trying to help or that they were intending to help. Um, so, um, um, and then he goes on to the court, uh, obviously, and um, it, it, it has an immediate impact. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Justice Thomas writes more opinions per year than any justice uh, on the court. Um, and this year, I think, was the first year in some time, actually, Justice Sotomayor wrote I think one or two more opinions than Justice Thomas. She, she wrote a lot of dissents this year, um, but 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 he's but he put down a body of work from the day he got on that court uh, that would be the, the the sort of the roadmap for an originalist uh, view of the Constitution that others could pick up. So even if he was a solo dissent, um, even if he was um, you know in concurrence, he was going to make his point. Uh, do the hard work, do the deep work, do the deep dive uh, on providing the evidence for why this particular, you know, clause in the Constitution should be applied this way. Um, same thing with sort of statutes and textualism, but going back to the Constitution, the most important document 
you know, uh, a roadmap, uh, a body of work. And you're seeing, I think, over the years um, with Justice Thomas laying these things down. And in fact, right, the, the left, and I could revisit this in some of the Q&A, but the left has always attacked Justice Thomas for, for, for being not qualified, right? When he first got on the court, there was cartoons, and some of them are in the movie, of Justice Thomas being, a, a, you know, um, dependent entirely on Justice Scalia. And there were these awful cartoons uh, in, in the movie uh, that were run in the press. And it was to belittle, disparage, you know, um, um, trash Justice Thomas. And all he did was he did his job. You know, he did it. And this was part of the problem, in my view, of sort of the narrative of Justice Thomas. Just going back to the confirmation, when those hearings were done, uh, and after all the Anita Hill allegations, which I think are absolutely false, the American people watched those hearings and it was 58 to, to 24 that, that they believe uh, Clarence Thomas over Anita Hill. Um, and only 26% of women believed uh, Anita Hill. So from the day, you know, th th that's, a, that's an overwhelming majority of people who believe Clarence Thomas was, was telling the truth. And then to go on the court and, and the, the attacks to continue uh, on Justice Thomas um, and in, in the most racist of ways. And you saw from Jan Greenberg Crawford's book um, that um, from the from I think the first conference that Justice Thomas sits in, um, he moves uh, he, he's he votes in solo dissent on um, I think it's uh, Forsha versus Louisiana, um, and by the time that case is, is is ultimately voted, he brings along Scalia and Rehnquist. So it shows Justice Thomas moving his colleagues to him. And he did that time and time again, and now you're seeing this body of work and his, his commitment to originalism, his um, you know, fearless commitment to originalism uh, bearing fruit. And you see with the EPA case, you see with the Dobbs case, you see with the Re religious uh, liberties case with uh, Coach Kennedy, um, all of these cases are, you know, are, are the justices in my view, looking at Justice Thomas for um, both his um, unapologetic originalism uh, and so his the boldness and courage of his opinions, but also the courage of his personal sort of commitment to never bowing down to the attacks that, to, that come to you. Um, so I'm happy to, I'm about, about half hour right now, happy to take questions um, uh, on, on, uh, on the book or anything else. And uh, Jack, thanks for having me. Of course, I feel like I could, I could hear you just talk for the rest of the half hour, but we'll certainly open it up to Q&A. Um, once again, to our audience, if you'd like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom right of the Zoom window. I will kick us off now with a question of my own. Um, you touched on it a little bit, I suppose, but sort of to contextualize some of the discussion in the book, uh, during the interviews, Justice Thomas discusses some of what he takes to be issues with our current separation of powers and constitutional problems with how government is currently carried out. Can you talk a little bit about how that philosophy and some of the things he discusses have showed up in recent cases like West Virginia v. EPA? Yeah, I mean, Justice Thomas, what's interesting, he just goes back to, you know, it, it's this, it, this um, interplay of talking about the current and going back to history um, and how the founders were very aware of the abuses from, from the crown and, and um, the British government and how you know, they separated these powers. Um, I'm just, let me see if I can find this. They, you know, they separated these powers uh, to protect our liberties. And, 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 and yet the administrative state and what's happening over the past 50 years, if not longer, is, is that, longer, uh, is that they were creating this, as he says, this, this sort of body outside the constitution and in, which was a coalescing of these three powers, again, the judicial, the legislative, and the executive, which was all meant, as, as he says to, um, he says the whole point was to keep the government in this box. Justice Scalia and I often talked about that, that the structure was the main way to protect your liberty. Um, the danger in the administrative state is seeing those, those powers all coalesce again in various agencies. And he makes a, a neat observation up top. He says, the very people who say they don't want government in their lives want this sort of expansive administrative state, which is in their lives and then every aspect of their lives. So, you know, I just love the way Justice Thomas sort of pinpoints uh, sort of what I call the sort of the hypocrisy of what's going on uh, and then how it um, 
doesn't accord with our constitution. And you're seeing the court starting to really address these issues uh, in some of these administrative state cases. Um, and um, yeah, so so it's uh, he, he touches on it several times in the interview, uh, but that was a good, I think, a, a little flavor of, 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 of how he talks about these issues in, in the interview. All right, we'll turn to audience Q&A now. One, one audience member is curious, what most surprised you when you were writing this book and going through the interviews? You know, I've, I've, I've known Justice Thomas for a long time and and, and close friends with him. I think it's just that fierceness uh, of his of, of his of not being told what to do in every aspect of his life, even during the interview of, of how Michael Packwood set up the question. Uh, and um, uh, so, so and then his again, his 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 thirst for knowledge, just again, knowing him well and but um, through his whole life of reading these books and trying to make sense of how, how to make it find that governing philosophy, find those, those, those answers and that continual quest for that. And then the other thing that a lot of people, um, you see it and, you know, we, when, he, when he talks about it is just how kind and giving Justice Thomas is to, to everyone. Uh, and, um, and, and he's been that way his entire life. And you see some of the, the hires, even including Anita Hill, his friend, you know, Gil Hardy, uh, who was his best friend at Holy Cross and at Yale um, had asked him to hire uh, Anita Hill because she was not doing well at her law firm. And he, you know, said, he, he goes back and he says, you know, when I came out of law school, I couldn't find a job. So I know what that's like. I know what it's like to struggle. And so when my friend asks me to help somebody, you know, I feel obligated to do that. And so there's a, you know, you saw the, the, um, the comments by Justice Sotomayor about Justice Thomas recently about how he knows everyone who works in the Supreme Court from the janitor to the justice. He knows their family. He knows, you know, their kids and what's going on with them. He takes real interest. So that part just shines through over and over and over again, um, and particularly in these interviews. Uh, so um, I, I, I was aware of that, you know, but it's, it's, it was just seeing it in action and hearing him talk about these things was just really, um, you know, in, interesting. I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about the, the confirmation process, given that you work directly on that. And we do have a question here specifically about um, some of the external voices that were at play there. Someone's curious about how just a year earlier, David Souter's experience was rated quite differently, even though it was pretty similar to uh, Justice Thomas's at the time. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that sort of thing and the confirmation process more generally? Yeah, so um, I'm just I'm looking at the question here. So th the confirmation process, so Justice, so the Souter one, you know, people forget that when Souter went through, um, and I was part of that um, process. I was a junior lawyer. Um, you know, they tried to make him into a monster. The left did uh, when when he first was kind of going through. Um, and obviously, he was not conservative um, or originalist. And but you saw kind of the the the, the characters that the, the left would even do to someone like David Souter. Um, Clarence Thomas had gone through the D.C. Circuit. In, in 1990, and um, and I so I had met Justice Thomas back in '83 when I was a senior in, in college, and met him on a trip. Spent about an hour with him, and was really taken with him. I was the first person to reach out to him um, in the White House in 19 March of 1989. To um, I was on the Judicial Selection Committee, um, and they were interested in uh, selecting Justice Thomas for the D.C. Circuit. So I reached out to him. Um, that's where I first kind of got to know him. And I think that the Democrats uh, were fine with him going on to the D.C. Circuit, um, it, you know, and, and said essentially, like, if you, again, going back to that time, they had this incredibly uh, voluminous document request that they sent to Justice Thomas, the Wall Street Journal, I think, ran in their editorial page and um, and, you know, took him through, I'll call the paces and, and all that, but um, made it clear that if he was going up to the Supreme Court, it would be a completely different story. And I think that, and I think the Democrats, after Justice Thomas went on the court, and we could talk a little bit about him trying to destroy him. I think they saw that letting any sort of conservative, you know, black or Hispanic 
get up to a, a, a circuit court is, is going to be trouble for them. So that's why, as you saw, Janice Rogers Brown, the Democrats filibustered, right? Miguel Estrada, the Democrats filibustered. And I think it went back to what they learned with Justice Thomas when he went on the D.C. circuit. Um, so the confirmation hearing um, was just he, he was nominated on July 1st by, by President Bush, July 1st, 1991. And literally from the first day that happened, it was just in a an effort by the left to destroy, attack him nonstop, um, you, you know, uh, on on made up things, uh, on 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 distorted things. And so that was a lot of my job was to work with Justice Thomas and the team on pushing back on all of these um, smears. Uh, and they were constant. I think we did a pretty good job. So and Justice Thomas was out there. So that by the time the hearings came along, people thought he was going to get confirmed, despite, you know, you had the NAACP come out against him. And now and 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 Justice Thomas talks about how this was all driven around. And it's interesting. We're talking about it right after this term it was all about abortion. Everything about going after Clarence Thomas was about abortion uh, and the left not wanting him to be on because they knew, I think, that he was this fiercely independent thinker who would rule uh, the way he, he, you know, he, and again, as he said, he hadn't thought about it at the time as a judge, you know, in, in terms of how to, where he would be on it. But I think they recognized that he was a person who was committed to uh, the, the constitution. Um, so it was a horrible experience. Um, you know, the hearings, um, you know, the first set of hearings in September was, I still think the longest on record uh, before the judiciary committee. Uh, and then obviously when the Anita Hill allegations um, were lodged, everything blew up. Uh, and to me, uh, the, the most kind of disgusting and despicable attacks on him. Um, but again, as I said, um, fighting back against those, those lies, in my view, um, you know, the American people got to see Anita Hill testify, got to see Clarence Thomas testify, got to see the various people who were the witnesses, uh, both supporting and, and, and supporting Thomas, supporting Hill. And it was overwhelmingly, you know, believing Clarence Thomas. So, um, the problem, in my view, is that um, you go on the Supreme Court and people think you, you have some army or you have some PR firm, you have somebody who's going to defend you. And you go on the court and Justice Thomas in particular is not going to go out and defend his reputation. And there isn't, there isn't a, a body that does that sort of stuff. So the left kept pushing this idea that Anita Hill had told the truth. Uh, that somehow Clarence Thomas hadn't told the truth. And so there's this drumbeat. And as, as, as I started off my talk, you know, 30 years or 25 years of just constant pounding of this narrative um, and, and books and, and, and that sort of thing made it where it's flipped. And that was, uh, and so that is, you know, a disappointing thing about the whole confirmation hearing uh, and, and its aftermath is that one side got to continually push their, their view and, um, um, and, and it, it had its effect. We have a really interesting question here about how for a long time, Justice Thomas seems to be writing more dissents than majority opinions. And now with the new balance of the court that that might be shifting and I'll just read, do you, we think his time as a dissenter or other solo opinion writer laying groundwork for potential future courts is nearly over or should we still expect significant solo opinions laying out views for the future? Um, let's see, I, I think that Obviously, the court is he's going to be writing a lot more <laughs> concurrences. I think the Dobbs one is a perfect example where, you know, the, the justices um, are aligned more with Justice Thomas, uh, but on the substance of due process, Justice Thomas one writes separately on that. So I think you can see by and large, um, you know, not always. I think Justice Thomas, you know, um, I don't know where maybe some of the more con law folks in the audience would would have a better sense of where Justice Thomas is splitting from his, you know, uh, originalist colleagues on certain things, or they have a different view uh, in their, their views on originalism on some, some aspect of it. But by and large, I think it will be, he's done the work for 30 years, uh, a lot of them in dissent, uh, laying that, that groundwork. Uh, the court is now aligned with him. There was a great, there was a great article. I, I have a footnote to it in, um, in my book, in, in, in this book, um, that it was an article, I think, in 2014 or 2015 by Chuck Cooper uh, on the administrative state cases in the in the three or four cases Justice Thomas wrote back then, uh, concurrences, maybe a dissent. Um, 
And, and Chuck Cooper said, you know, Justice Thomas is writing on this and no other justice is. And it's likely to be that we won't have any justices, be, you know, sort of coming to his side for the foreseeable future. And yet, you know, a few years later, right, in 2022, uh, the world has changed um, because of these appointments, because of President Trump's appointments uh, to the Supreme Court. And so, um, so I think you'll, like I said, I think you'll you'll probably see some dissents from Justice Thomas from time to time. Uh, on and again, when when the court uh, when there's those alignments where it's not an originalist of you, uh, he'll certainly be writing in dissent. But hopefully, there'll be uh, majorities and mostly concurrences. Do you think not to put you on the spot too much here, but is there a particular opinion that you think? Uh, does a particularly good job of distilling Justice Thomas's philosophy or maybe a favorite opinion of yours? Anything come to mind there? Um, again, I think I think there's there's so many of them and, and I'll leave it to the maybe the Thomas former clerk. I love the Dobbs decision because Justice Thomas, you know, w- went out of his way to stay true to what he's been writing on for 30, 30 years, which is that substantive due process is completely made up. <laughs> uh, you don't want uh, unelected judges coming up with new rights or telling, you know, the American people what your rights are. And, and again, in classic Thomas fashion, he talks about, you know, even though it was before the 14th Amendment, the Roger Taney uh, opinion, the worst opinion perhaps ever uh, in Dred Scott, where he essentially says there is a substantive due process right to, to, to you know, for slave owners, uh, to, uh, for property interest in their in their slave. And then even though there was a law that said, you know, if you, you know, if this person escaped the South and, you know, got to the North, you were free. No, Roger Taney had different ideas. And so, you know, I think Justice Thomas in, you know, in, in classic Thomas fashion is saying, you know, this is what you may like these rights, but here's what happens when you don't like these rights. Or we allow people to, to have the power to do that. Um, he did that in Grutter too, where he talks about, um, uh, the, the arguments that the, uh, the, the litigants for uh, affirmative action were arguing, he basically said that the racists, the segregationists back in the race cases, as he called them, were making the exact same arguments in their briefs. And he actually cites to them. Uh, and um, so those are the kinds of things where Justice Thomas does the deep dive and he's calling out the other side that, that I like. Um, you know, the McDonald case where he goes through the history of gun control and how it was meant to, you know, to prevent blacks from getting guns. That the, the, the racist, you know, um, uh, uh, Southerners that were um, you know, passing laws. And so he he loves to put things, you know, sort of what I call, you know, um, plainly uh, as to what's going on. Um, I just to, before I forget, I I've set up two websites. So. Um, um, JusticeThomas.com is one that has a lot of his opinions, some of these opinions right here in analysis. Some of the Thomas clerks have written uh, some of the material. It's got links to his speeches, articles, articles about him. So that's JusticeThomas.com. And then because I've done so much work on uh, the Anita Hill, Thomas, uh, Clarence Thomas hearings, I have a website called AnitaHillCase.com that goes through those hearings uh, comprehensively, every witness, there's a write-up on um, and uh, why her story never added up, as I say, is the, I think the subtitle of the of the website. So I'd encourage your your viewers to go look at those two those two websites. We have an, an audience member here who had the pleasure of meeting Justice Thomas and noted that they were particularly struck by his optimism. Can you yeah. speak a little bit about how uh, that shines through in the interviews and how you might have experienced that in your your personal relationship with him? Yeah, I, I, it's optimism. I call it joyful. It's a joyful life that he lives. He loves his friends. He loves his family. Um, and he's just always, when I say laughing, he's just enjoying life. Uh, and so that's what most people are so shocked by when you, um, you, you meet Justice Thomas. I was on Tucker Carlson and he mentioned the same thing. He met Justice Thomas several years ago and was floored that this image of him uh, as this dour, um, angry, um, you know, person is just belied by, he's just everyone who meets him. He's, I call it electrifying. He's got so much energy. And the other thing that he does, and this is lots of people can be energetic or, um, (laughs) joyful, I guess, but, um, but he's so interested in the person he's talking to 
it, no matter who you are. And that's the part I also think is, is, uh, is um, really surprising to people is just, you know, people will come in and visit him. You know, a friend of a friend will meet Justice Thomas and say, you should stop by the, the, my chambers, you know, and they end up talking to Justice Thomas for two hours. Uh, and or when he's at these events, he does this Horatio Alger event, which is a, a group he's been involved with for many years with kids who have gone through terrible, terrible times who are, are, you know, sort of have done well in school and have gotten a scholarship and being supported by um, with the scholarship through this group. And he spends hours with these high school students uh, or going into college. And it's um, th that's th so that's optimism, that's um, joyfulness. And so um, you, you, you had it in the movie uh, and he's laughing about some things. Um, Obviously, going through his life in some of the more painful moments was difficult, and you see that uh, in, in in the movie. Um, but but overwhelmingly, it's his optimism and joyfulness. We have a, a sort of fun question here, wondering if all the cutting room floor material from the movie ended up in this book, or is there maybe a part two coming, or is this it? Yeah, it's probably it. Um, you know when. Um, when Michael Pack was, so, you know, it's, it's one thing to go into a, so this was going to be a movie when this project was first launched, it was to make a movie uh, on PBS because Michael Pack had done, you know, most of his movies on, on, on PBS. And so you're going to, you're going to film it that way, what you're looking for to make a movie. And so when sometimes you go back over and you have another session and maybe, you know, the discussion was a certain way, but Michael thought, let me just go revisit that. And it could be weeks later, whatever it was, a month later, you know, Justice Thomas might be talking about the same thing because Michael Pack would have brought up the, the same topic, you know what I mean? And it kind of goes a little bit different. So there's a lot of rep, there's some repetition in, 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 the, in, the, in the interview. Uh, but right now, at least it was, let me put it this way, it was a lot more work than I thought it would be to put it all together. And um, I, I knew I wanted to get this out and I went you know, through the book and, or through the interview. And this is what we came up with um, maybe down the road. Uh, but for now it's, it's, it's this, this is uh, this is it. And I have some other Thomas related projects I want to focus on. Um, and so maybe at some point I'll go back and look through the, the through the, to the interview again and see if there's, there's, there is more stuff there, obviously, but, um, but, um, uh, but I think this is the best uh, cut on it. So how long do you think Justice Thomas will serve? And in a big picture sense, what do you think will be his ultimate legacy? I think Justice Thomas will serve for another 10 or 15 years. Uh, you know, when he was confirmed, he was 43 years old, he said the left had robbed him of his 43 years. They had just, you know, kind of taken away his, tried to destroy his reputation. So he's at 31. Uh, so, you know, he's got 12 more years by his own uh, lights. And um, I think it will be longer. He loves his job. I think he gets energy from it. And he's, uh, he knows, you know, um, this is where he, he, he belongs. Uh, he's in good health. Uh, and so I expect him to, to serve. As, as long as he's physically able, and I'm hoping that's 20 years. Uh, you know, he's 74, uh, so um, so he's got a lot of time. Uh, and then his legacy, um, I, I think it's, I guess, two maybe twofold in terms of, obviously, his jurisprudence and his unflinching commitment to originalism. Uh, I think he's the greatest originalist on the court uh, and has been. Um, and so that body of work, I think, will um, will will be a, a great legacy. And you see the court already coming towards, you know, kind of his view on, on many, many things. I also think his legacy of, you know, more than any other justice, I think um, he has 15 former clerks as judges, most of them on the federal bench. And he, um, um, you know, he's got a he's got a, a army of former clerks that are out there. And then I think he's inspired a whole generation of lawyers to think this way. And when I say think this way, be bold, uh, you know, believe in yourself, you know, and, and, and be fearless. And, and so in his jurisprudence and then also in his personal life that they see him under attack nonstop, you know, and he never gives an inch. He never moves. And that's inspiring to, I think, a lot of people. And I hope, I, I think he, 
hopes it shows a, a, an example of, of how to be courageous in, in these times. And um, so that's what I think his legacy will ultimately be. And I think, again, on the current court, you know, a lot of these, you know, justices, and particularly on the conservative side, were, were clerks when he was up there. And I think they got to see, uh, you know, a, a, a justice who was a committed originalist. Um, there was that great, uh, during Justice Gorsuch's confirmation, which I worked on, there was an email that came out where Neil Gorsuch is at the Department of Justice, and the Kelo decision comes down. Um, and, and, and Justice Thomas's dissent, and he emails Greg Katzis, <laughs> Uh, like, wow, look at this Thomas dissent, like, you know, what a guy. And so to me, it would just show like the impact he's having. You can't replace that of a young lawyer seeing a justice kind of throw down, if you will, on his view of what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and it, th those are two, right, just, a, 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 well, one's a justice and one's a judge on the court. And the impact that Justice Thomas had on them when they were young lawyers. And I think that's through and through so many you know, young lawyers who are older and, and coming into positions of, of influence and responsibility. Well, I'll do one final call for questions here. Once again, to our audience, you can submit through the Q&A box in the bottom right of the Zoom window. And while we wait to see if we get any more, I will just close out with a sort of more fun one. What is something about Justice Thomas that would surprise the average American that hasn't met him? Well, again, it's been written about a little bit, but he loves to go out on his bus. Uh, it, it, it's a real bus. It's a Prevo kind of Greyhound type bus that's been outfitted to be a sort of a, a personal living space. Um, and I've been on it, uh, been out on it a bunch with him. And he's just this regular guy, you know, and, and it, but people kind of sometimes recognize him. Uh, but but he loves to go out on his bus and see America. He goes out with Ginny. They've been to about 40 states um, over the years and they stay in camping grounds and Walmart parking lots and that sort of stuff. And um, so he's, uh, and he knows everything about a bus. He knows every engine size or, you know, he can fix his bus <laughs> uh, uh, when need be, but um, sort of a, he's a gearhead in that, in that regard. Uh, but that's probably maybe something surprising for, for, for people. Certainly. Well, thanks so much, Mark. This has been absolutely fantastic. Um, sorry, just double checking to make sure we don't have any more questions coming in. I think we are all set with that. I mean, any any closing comments here? No, I, I uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I hope everyone will read the book, um, buy the book, read the book uh, and watch the movie um, and and visit the sites. You know, Justice Thomas, he'll never do anything to, you know, when, when Michael Pack um, agreed to do the movie, uh, Justice Thomas had not, wasn't convinced, we had to convince him uh, to actually participate, uh, to be interviewed because he's that, what I'll call uninterested in his, you know, in his legacy or putting out his legacy or, you know, proclaiming it. So I hope the members of, of federal, of the federal society will, will do that, you know, um, you know, re read Justice Thomas's you know, memoirs um, and, 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 and watch the movie and, and buy this book uh, and, and defend him when he's being attacked by the left and, and I'll call it spread the good news, but, but defend him. Cause yeah, I do think, He's our greatest justice and our greatest living American right now. And, and he needs defending. Uh, he's been under constant attack. Um, and um, and so, so those are my closing thoughts. Ken, thank you enough, Mark, for, for taking the time. And thanks again to our audience for tuning into today's event. You can check out our website, fedsoc.org, or throw us a follow on all the major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date. With that, we are adjourned.